Hey friends, this is Neeti the Pharmacist. Welcome to our YouTube Live here at the Food Church. I'm super excited because I have all five authors of The Red Pill Revolution. If you haven't gotten your copy, you should get it. It is the bomb. I love it. One of the first things I want to say to all of you that made me so happy about this book is that I no longer feel alone. If I did feel a little bit alone, I do not anymore. So I appreciate the relief. I think everyone right now is seeking relief and everyone should um, get this for no other reason, but just for the relief. Um, well, you know, when you just, just from the get go, you, you've said what we set out to do. Which, which was to, to I mean, what, <clears throat> the intent of this book has been to be a gift to humanity. And I know that sounds pompous if you haven't read it, but are, are these five, um, well, these four amazing gentlemen and my good self, we've, we've all met um, and come together at a sort of level of understanding of how the world actually is from very different starting points. And we've all come to the same body of understanding and that's when we met and it was a very uh i would i think i would go as far to say it was a recognition when we met each other and started to uh, you know formally talk about working and doing something and <clears throat> that was the human unleashed mm. which is a membership site but when we decided to write this book the red pill revolution it really was before the covid scandemic had begun and yes i will call it that um, before it began, and we felt a great pressure in the world, and we felt what it needs is a bridge um, to understand the foundation, the pillars, if you like, of the problems in, in, with a positive skew on it. I have to say, many of the chapters, Graham and I particularly, didn't really want to go at it from a positive point of view. We wanted to go much harder and possibly darker, but but Ben, who ultimately was the wordsmith and what a, an amazing job he's done, found a tone <clears throat> in the book, which I think you'll agree, is you and everybody else that's read it and given us a review are always, it's just wonderfully positive. And that's what we set out to do. So thank you for that immediate compliment because we've achieved that. I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Because I have been feeling, by the way, I've been on this food freedom, health independence journey for 12 years. And I mean, that's what my book is about. And it's sharing our story. And um, it was very difficult for me to find a positive way to share our story. So I really, really, I mean, that was the first thing that struck me with this book was that I know it had to be hard for you guys to do that because there are so many assaults that you are uh, navigating and reconciling and, and you're giving the um, reader uh, the assault with um, already having uh, figured out how to, um, to, to really resolve it and to accept it. I think that honestly with, you know, the golden age pouring in and with everything wonderful that will happen as this landscape is, you know, I mean, people don't re realize what's going on, but the cleansing that is happening in this moment is so powerful. And, you know, um, you know, like, many people have said, you know, volcanoes don't shape the landscape gently. So it is like a really, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to get too far into, I, I can just start going on and on and on. I want to, I want you guys to talk about this first. I want to know red, the red pill revolution. Now this is coming from the matrix to me, at least it is, um, Ben or anyone, would you like to tell us how you came up with this title? Yeah, well, the, the red pill has pretty much been adopted as a, a cultural meme to represent waking up from one world into into another world. So, yeah, it comes from this scene in The Matrix where uh, Neo finds Morpheus, they find each other. Morpheus says, I can offer you the red pill and the blue pill. If you take the 
red pill, if you take the blue pill, you'll wake up tomorrow, things will be just as they were. If you take the red pill, I'm going to show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. He says, I can only show you the door, you have to walk through it. And that's really what the book tries to do, is that we're, we're, we're opening the door a crack and letting people look through, but we're not going headfirst down, down the rabbit hole too hard. So we, 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 did, we wrote it as a, a, a gentle guide to show people that they're... The, and the, the parallels to the movie The Matrix are, are so great um, because in, in The Matrix, this, this guy, the main character, Neo, he, he's plagued by this feeling that there's something else beneath the surface, that the world that he's living in is not quite as it appears to be. And that's exactly the, you know, the common ground that we all came on, that actually there is a true, real, natural world that has always lived and been run by um, natural law, God's laws, nature, what, however you want to call it. And then on top of that, we have this artificial man-made construct that is the modern world, essentially, the Neolithic world that has only been around for 10, 15,000 years, but has gathered in acceleration and pace to the point where kids now, you know, people who are born now, they, they don't know where milk comes from. They, you know, they, they, we are so divorced from the previous 99% of human uh, life on this, on this good, wonderful earth. I had a gentleman last week who didn't know that asparagus came out of the ground, thought it was from a tree, an adult. Yeah, we're so disconnected now and by all these, you know, the, the, the supply chain, we're actually, we've already started work preparing our next book, which is going to be the red pill food revolution, um, because it's so much of it comes down to food. And the fact that throughout the whole paleo paleolithic era, Life was about food was life, life was food. The, the two were inseparable. You probably didn't even need a word for it, you know. And we would be we would walk out into nature and we would gather, hunt what we wanted, and it was all there. It was all there for the taking. And somehow now we've gone to this system where we don't we don't know what it is most of the time, and most of the food, most of what we call food that's on the grocery store shelves isn't actually food at all. It doesn't meet the criteria of food. It isn't nourishing. It doesn't support health. Um, you can't recognize it's a, it. You it's don't... a chemistry project, right? They've taken these, these things, these pieces of organic matter. Um, I, and when I say organic matter, I don't even, I mean, everything's organic on this planet. Let's just start with that, right? But so calling it organic doesn't mean it's cleaner or better or whatever that the lie is that has been told to everyone, but, um, right. There is, there is no food anywhere. It, it appears that there's food everywhere, but there is no food anywhere. Phil, you want to talk more about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it, what, what's interesting to me is, is with the five of us, the, the different ways that we've woken up to all of this, you know, and, and for me, it was a, a lot of it was through food. I think it's um, I think it's fascinating how in 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 recent times during this this whole pandemic lark, it's interesting to see how close people's dominoes are together. And by that I mean some people you knock down one thing and the whole lot goes down. You start to see all the deception in everything. And some people you sort of need to knock one domino down at once and kind of push them. And some people, I mean, unfortunately, they've got their first domino glued to the table. But um, with, with, with me, the, the, a lot of it was to do with food. I mean, I had, um, I, I, I thought that I knew loads about health and about diet and I was all into the whole um, Ayurvedic thing and vegetarian thing. And, and I had to get really sick for my dominoes to get knocked down because I was I was um, looking at the table the wrong way and thought the dominoes were already lying down, but they weren't. You know, some they were they they were they were really stacked up the wrong way. And it's funny, isn't it? I mean, you and I have both been on Sean's podcast on Meet Our Ex, and you work with him, and uh, it, it, it's it's amazing to see how this one little thing, this sort of fatty meat 
can fix I mean, many times if it's eaten on its own, almost everything it's said to, to cause. And that's and more. That's and, and, and more, right, Phil? So isn't it interesting that nature has so much grace? Even if you're defying nature constantly with this fake food and whatever it is that you're doing, you know, nature, mother nature is, is like mother anyway, right? Unconditionally loving, unconditionally uh, providing solution, unconditionally welcoming you back to the path, back to the light. I find this book to be a light on the path. I mean, you can call it a red pill if you want to or whatever. But to me, I feel like it is the path that we should all be walking. And it is just lighting the way for everyone to find their way. And everyone is welcome. Everyone's welcome. Well, that's very much when we sat down to we didn't sit down and say, let's write a book. We, we sat down and we were we were working together on this, the, the health project we have, this, which is a membership sort of the, the human unleash the human unleashed project and it's based on how to fix your own health and it's using all of our different experiences to sort of unpick the problems that people have encountered and to try to help them find the path back to good health and the issues we were having was how do we get people to consider this and we know that out there in the world there are millions of people who are already sick there, were, there are hundreds of millions more who are on the path to sickness. And they are going, when they, when they finally get sick enough, they don't know that they're sick yet. But yeah, everybody's sick. sick. Who's not sick? I'm trying to yeah. figure out where the healthy people are because what is defined as health is not actually. And also everyone is made to believe that as you age, you fall apart. And that is an acceptable yeah. thing, which is absolutely false. But yeah. Graham, please continue and tell us all how you guys got together because you all are all over the place. So please, I mean, you, you're already on the path of telling us this, but tell us how you guys got together to, to talk about well, this. We, the, we, we got together through Phil. I mean, Phil is the, the sort of uh, uh, a, a weapon of mass, mass construction is our, our nickname for him. Um, and so we, we basically all met pretty much via Phil. Um, I think I met him first. Uh, then, then one day I was down at Phil's and Jeremy came along, and I I got the impression that Phil and Jeremy went to school together, or at least have known each other since their school days. But yeah, in fact, they've only known each other for two or three years, for the same length of time that, that Phil had known me. And then we went to. Visit it was ben. the first time. It was the first time we'd met Jeremy and I. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Then we went to meet Ben and it was the same scenario. I was like, oh, is Ben another old friend of yours from school? Like it was that, that kind of situation. Uh, we've all come at this from, I would say, quite different backgrounds. We're obviously all uh, middle-aged white guys, um, well, mainly from the UK, uh, with the exception of John. But we all have many interests in common, but we, we've come about it from a completely different way. I mean, Phil went through the whole, uh, I'm a hippie, then I'm going to go and do meditation, then I'm going to eat vegan food and all that sort of thing and get terribly ill, and then eventually found his way back to health. I know Ben's been through kind of some religious cult type uh, brainwashing at some point in his life. Uh, he went the uh, politically left-wing route um, and, and, and got into sort of the idea of saving the planet and soil and regenerative agriculture that way. Jeremy spent 30 years slaving away, helping people to heal themselves and having all sorts of trouble from the authorities for doing a great job. Um, myself, I was in the financial industry. Um, and I had a, a sort of realisation about 20 years ago that I'd, I'd already been in the business for about 15 years and I couldn't figure out that why I wasn't better at my job, having had 15 years of experience. And how things in the in the financial markets, I, I was unable to predict them with a better than 50-50 you know, probability, which yeah, was poor. And I was disappointed in my in my my own performance. And I looked into the financial aspect of things and I discovered precious metals, gold and silver, and that kind of 
derivative of money that we we now use rather than using a true representation of wealth and I, that was the answer that i was looking for uh having discovered that our financial system had been separated from real wealth about 100 years ago and more more seriously about 50 60 years ago i then realized that everything that's happened since then has been effectively fake and created and ultimately controlled by whoever controls the money um and that in itself is huge because it, it literally means that every single thing that you experience in your your day-to-day -day life has been artificially uh, created with artificial money according to the desires and the goals of the people controlling the money um and then i from yeah, that, that i began to background yeah. that's why that's why we ended up writing the chapters and going to this book because with the human unleashed project and i'll give right back to graham we said our main problem is just about everything we're going to try and teach people is probably going to uh, go against what they believe is correct. And unless we start deconstructing how we got here, <clears throat> it will just seem like some, you know, uh, chaps that want to talk conspiracy rubbish and get paid for it, which is not the case. And that was the original intent behind the book, a foundation for people to stand on, on how we got here. Because right. they're, they're in such busyness that they do, they're either in busyness or being ended, entertained or something that they haven't stopped to go, oh my God, we are actually being directed down a route that has nothing to do with me and everything to do with someone else. Back to you, Graham, sorry to interrupt. I wanna interrupt real fast too and speak to, to what you just said, Jeremy, because that's important. That was one of the other reasons I love this and Graham, I'll give it right back to you as well. But, um, you know, everyone is, beliefs are just thoughts you keep thinking. That's all it is. Beliefs are just thoughts you keep thinking and you can change your belief as soon as right now. If you just decide that you you don't want to think that way anymore, you can just decide and you can do that by, by having a conversation or by reading this book or by finding any information anywhere and, and researching. But, you know, we're not allowed to do that. And, and so that's what I love about the book, too, is that it is lightly uh, going, what about this? What about, what about this? What about, what about that? What, you know, very lightly. And then no one can argue it. Like the game, the Monopoly reference here, you know? And the fact that, the, that this actually is the rules of the game, which is true. And I love it. I, it was so brilliant. When I read that, I was just like, hmm. These guys. What we were trying to do was we all had the experience that we might be trying to help somebody that we know, friend, family member, new acquaintance. And it could be in the area of health, could be in the area of nutrition, could be in the area of money. And we all found that in order to try to, in order to begin helping them, it's almost like you have to have a, a, a preamble, which is three hours long, which is, let me uh, let i'm gonna have to explain a few things first before we can actually start the conversation and we found that with everything um and so what we what we decided to do was let's write a book and and all of us here i mean and john who I, I haven't mentioned yet is also he he has he's been involved in all sorts of things he's a musician as are, as are a couple of other guys i'm not um and he's been involved in publishing, but he's also looked into the the idea of uh, sovereignty, and he's an absolute expert on 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 the whole sovereignty, free man, and 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 your 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 God given rights, that side of things. And all of us, we've spent twenty years, twenty twenty five years, digging deep on the internet, reading, and this is on the internet when you could find stuff before it was hidden, when it was a little bit easier to find. And now, if you are if you're remotely uh, curious nowadays, you just get swamped in nonsense. And it, the internet, although all the information is in theory, it's out there. It's virtually impossible to capture nowadays. It's virtually impossible to find your way through all the all the bullshit. So, what we wanted to do was take our cumulative 100 years of internet delving and put it into a a readable format 
to quickly get people up to speed without terrifying them and, and just sort of just to sort of break the veil enough so that they could see that it's just something that's been cast over their eyes by the people who are in charge uh, and we don't need to go into who is it which group is in charge why are they doing this it it, it it's explained in the book in in simple terms like why wouldn't they do this they've always it's mr global it. and and i think that yeah. the way that you guys went about it was brilliant and people out there should know there is no law of assertion that is the reason why what you're saying makes so much sense but people don't understand that everyone has been made to believe that they are to fear something nature mostly nature right and that um, it is because something is always happening to them. But I mean, I've been saying this for a very long time and I, I'm saying it every week. I'm like, nothing is happening to you. You are choosing whatever it is that you are experiencing. And so you guys do a very nice job of explaining that in here. Um, and, 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 you know, my story goes back to like the various institutions. I've, I can relate to everybody here except for you, Graham, in terms of economics. I'm learning that. So you were teaching that to me, which I love. That was the one missing piece because I am a rogue food leader and I was dealing with health and I was dealing with the medical mafia and I, was, you know, on a spiritual level, I also get that part. But like you're teaching me the the financial aspects, which I'm I couldn't well, articulate. Well, for me, once, one side. Once discovered the truth about finance which it was embarrassing that I spent 15 years in the industry without knowing it but once I discovered that that then gave me a solid foundation to go and explore the other areas mm -hmm. like the health and the you know I became very very interested in the in the, the food and the health aspects which is how I ended up meeting Phil. John but, can you talk about this? Absolutely hello from uh, the states um divided states of corporate America. Um, yeah, that, that particular meme and there, and, and there are lots, you know, I, ho hopefully the book is a, is, is a very enjoyable and easy read. There's, 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 it's very meme heavy and, and they all have purpose, but that particular. It's, fun. it's a fun book to read. It's easy and it's fun. Sorry, go ahead. That, that particular one, um, that touches on something that's in, incredibly important to me. And uh, thank you for the, the compliment in that realm, Graham. Uh, right back at you with the, all of your amazing knowledge in the, in the, in the finance realm. But there is, um, you know, Ben touched on it in his, in his intro about there being two different worlds. There's that natural world. And then there's, let's just for the sake of ease, let's call it the commercial world. And um, I, I think probably- Can we call it the political world for a minute? Because I'm learning about agorism. Are y'all familiar with that? I, I, am, a, I am a devout agorist. Uh, Samuel okay, Conkin, so take Samuel, it away from- Samuel Conkin is a, is, is a hero. There is a gray and black flag that hangs over my bed. Um, no, there, there you go. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep. You know those. I, I, I'm I'm going to stick to the the term commercial because I don't think that any of us have lived a day on Earth where we have experienced non-commercial politics. Um, it is all corporate. It is all commercial, and um, I think everybody has at one point or another in their lives, hopefully in the past and not recent, but had a, a just a horrible relationship where the other person has just sucked the life out of you and, and, and taken advantage of you and just ate at your soul. And you were the last person to realize it. There were people around you that saw it coming a mile away, but they, you know, maybe, 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 maybe everyone can relate to that feeling. And maybe somebody had that one sensible headed person who came up and said, Hey, um, this is happening, whether you want to acknowledge it or not. And, I'm here for you. If you want to talk it through, um, I hope that the book is a bit like that because there is a uh, there is a bit of a Stockholm syndrome effect going on with a significant portion of people on on, on Earth right now that seem to be in love with their corporate commercial captor, and um, that that meme just kind of touches to the the heart of it all. It's corporations are commercial and 
Corporations cannot feel, they are not real, they are fiction. There is a reason why the term corporate fiction exists. If you're not familiar with the term corporate fiction, I would in, in just encourage everyone to go look it up. Um, so to expect corporations, i.e. governments, i.e. colleges, i.e. Um, medical pharmaceutical mafia. companies, any of those corporate entities, if, to expect them to feel, expect them to have morals, expect them to be looking out for your best interest is, it's, it's, it's foolish, but it's also, um, it's also technically not in the best interest of a corporation to look out for your or my best interest. Corporations have a duty to themselves, to their charter, and that duty is simply to be profitable and to be self-perpetual. So it's almost, now, now you're, you're, you're talking to a devout agorist, so I am the last person who is going to defend corporate behavior, but I will, you know, when it's true, it's true. It's almost, um, it, it's, it's almost rude of us to expect corporations to behave because they're not going to going on i mean the yeah. money the money uh, the corporate aspect is the foundation of the problems because my first mentor uh, the great harry hawes um who is a wonderful english um <clears throat> osteopath you know said it's a rare man um that that can truly make the right choices for his patients and remove money out of that equation. <clears throat> now he's talking at a very low level, but what we saw early on, what drove me, because what this book really is, is the emperor has no clothes. It is the little boy pointing out to everybody what we can now clearly see. And, and once that veil lifts, you can see it. But every from whatever angle, whatever subject you want to start with, if you take the corporate model, the, the only reason truth, and we'll call it that, I mean, no one knows the truth, but let's say more correct. And by the way, I want to give Graham a compliment because that sort of is what ties us all together. When he said, I felt foolish or embarrassed that I'd been 15 years, that's the difference with these chaps and what we encourage the readers to become, the willingness to recognize you've been wrong. I mean, Phil will tell you he spent most of his life wrong thinking he was right to get to where he is today. <clears throat> but it's but it's that healthy attitude of recognizing you're wrong or more wrong or in whatever that has enabled us to keep looking and, and advancing and arguably why we've been so good at it. But but back to the corporate money thing, no matter what subject matter you take, politics, um, pollution, um, whatever, the medicine, you know, right. the, on the only reason someone like me has to do what I have to do to, to, to keep working and helping people. And I'm not a consult to a government or, or a hospital is mm -hmm. because I'm going to lose them a fortune in sales. Well, because nature and, and okay, first of all, we live in an abundant world. So that's number one. Number two, I love in the book that you're saying, um, you cannot fix the system because it is, is it's not immoral. Um, because to be moral, it would have to be alive first. Okay. Which is beautifully stated. And then it says, so we can only describe the system as amoral. All of us arrived in this moment because we all felt stupid or taken advantage of in some way, shape or form. I mean, I was so stupid. I let the doctors like medically murder our daughter because I did not think that I was capable of making better decisions because I was I allowed myself to believe that I didn't know anything as a mother because that's what the system trained me to do. So we've all been trained. And so we, we should go ahead and let go of the fact that none of us have arrived here lightly. None of us have arrived here on purpose in terms of um, we didn't purposefully harm ourselves or harm others. Um, I think everything, you know, they say that the, 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 um, the path, the evil, the path to evil or whatever is always paved with great intentions. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. You can all correct me. 
<laughs> but but I think that there were a lot of people, uh, you know, who who were doing things with the best of intentions, and it has has turned into this. I mean, we could use capitalism, I think, Graham, as an example, right? But you're the you're the expert on that. That you know, capitalism sounds really good, but when they created the corporate America instead of allowing the government to be what it was originally set out to be as a republic, that um, that is the reason why we're now, you know, agorism is taking over in the sense of well, trying we, to we, remediate. We don't have capitalism. Right. We haven't had capitalism. Um, Correct. Because my understanding when I was my first 15 years in finance, I believed that we had a capitalist system. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if I analyzed all the moving parts correctly, that's kind of I, I have sort of an engineering logical mind. So I love the whole finance aspect uh, and the, 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 fun, the stock market particularly is just lots and lots of moving parts and different inputs. And, and you should be able to figure it out. And the reason I wasn't able to figure it out was that we had a system where one of the key requirements for capitalism is sound money. The money itself has to be sort of sacrosanct and cannot be interfered with. Uh, and the moment that we detached real wealth, if, if you earn money, you, you, you spend your own sweat earning money and you get something in return. You get a gold. Let's say you get a gold coin. You do a job. You're, you're going to do a you paint someone's house. You do a physical job. You do a great job. The guy's happy and he pays you a gold coin. You're happy with that. He's happy with that. Everyone's happy. You put that gold coin in a drawer, you want to save it. You come back in five years' time, that gold coin's still there. And that gold coin's still worth, in the real world, you could still go and have your house painted. Yeah, that, that's what it's worth. It's worth the sweat of someone who was going to paint your house. If you, take, if you got paid in cash and you get, let's say, $2,000 for painting the house, you put that $2,000 in the same drawer, you lock it away for five years, you come back, that $2,000 is now worth $1,000. But the, the drawer's been locked. How could someone steal it? How could that value disappear? What has occurred? And, and that's, what we allowed, <laughs> that's what we allowed to happen 100 years ago. So since we allowed someone to control the money, the system has been totalitarian. It has not been a free market capitalist system from from 1913 onwards and that's what many many people today especially people on the left the, the people on the left blame capitalism for all sorts of problems and you point out to them but we've had a totalitarian socialist quasi-communist system for a hundred years so you can't be blaming capitalism for the problems and, th and that's the other issue people they get drawn in the left-right paradigm which mm. is just the training two goes back to the training. The same corporate entity. They're they're trained not to question any of these things, and you're absolutely correct, Ben. You're gonna. Yeah, well, yeah. Obviously, the left-right paradigm is just two sides of the same coin. It's from. It comes from the 18th century, in bosses versus workers, and bosses versus workers is not. You know, that's only one paradigm. It's not really what it's about. But to have. To have capitalism, Graham, surely you have to have a free market. And there is no way that we can say that we live in a free market today. You go back 150 years, let's just talk about food for a second. You go back 150 years, you've got small farmers all over the land. You've got, let's take like bread, right? Small farmers, they grow grain, they sell it to a baker. The baker has a choice of which farmer he buys from. The farmers can choose which bakers they sell to. The housewives can choose which, you know, mills and whatever they they choose and that was relatively free but then what what we've got now is we've got this this oligarchy we've got everything is now you've got the rise of the big you know grain elevators and the meat packers and they all come together and the power concentrates to such a level that they can squeeze every small producer out of the market and if a brand pops up that people go oh, i like that brand it's fresh it feels like me they buy it and they crush the soul out of it so there's no there's no way there's a free market now. Everything and the, comes and back. The, and the, the the big corporates are ultimately buying it with freshly created artificial money that they haven't yet earned. And then you put you can put in a say a 
regulations people go oh well there's i'm sure that wouldn't happen because there are regulations there's a regulator at the, the food and drug there's a regulator on agriculture there's regular this but what people don't realize is the regulators are put in place by the corporate giants to protect them from competition to eliminate the possibility of competition so everything's so, upside down everything is right. completely upside down there's no okay so everyone is made to believe that there are checks and balances in place because they believe there's several of these beliefs that are absolute lies that I had to hurt, learn the hard way. Anyone who has been medically violated has learned this the, the hard way. For example, um, people think that the government is structured for checks and balances, as you as you're saying, like with the FDA, USDA, and we know there's a revolving door there, and we know the corporations are uh, self-regulating, which is nonsense. Okay, that's number one. Number two, everybody believes that doctors operate um, under a Hippocratic oath. In fact, I've been talking with some attorneys about this recently. And what a lot of people don't understand is when the Flexner report was submitted into Congress, then they effectively um, created a standard of care. And that standard of care doesn't allow for uh, medical practitioners to actually operate with that Hippocratic oath. Even if they know better, they have to operate under standard of care. And when they're doing that, I mean, it's it's a de facto law. It's not actually a de jure, I mean, a de jure law, which means that it's not a real law. It has just been in practice for so long that it has become the standard, the law. And, um, and all of the... Um, insurance companies and whatever. Jeremy, you probably can speak to that, I think. Could I could I nip in on that one just for a sec before Jeremy yeah. does? Because I wanted to talk about Jeremy here and and how not only is it is it something, you know, it's somebody watching this might think, oh, you know, we're there to sort of wake everybody up and all that. And maybe to an extent, but I think all of us this past year have 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 woken up to many different things. It's been a time of incredible revealing. And, and for me, I mean, Jeremy always told me, I used to sort of think, oh, well, docs, they're just a bit silly. And he used to just sort of look at me and shake his head and go like, you're going to learn at some point. And, and I've had some big rude awakenings, mostly with things that have happened to children this year, that things are, are, are quite evil at, at a certain level of this. Now, of course, there are all the foot soldiers, the, the, the useful idiots that are kind of brainwashed in this. But I just today I was thinking I was driving along and I was listening to a podcast and it was with um, Dr. Shiva Ayaduri and, and he's, uh, you know, in Massachusetts, I believe, and, and he was going for, for, for election. And I think this last little while is, is just that the, the system, the, the, the controllers are putting so many feet wrong, getting so desperate that it's really obvious. It's almost like a child in the middle of the playground that ends up having such a tantrum and screaming at everybody. And I couldn't remember his surname. So a second ago, I, I, I thought, I thought I'd, uh, I, I'd, I'd just Wikipedia him just for his surname, but we all know Wikipedia is nonsense. And now immediately, look at this. It says he's a promoter of conspiracy theories, pseudoscience and unfounded medical claims. But among the rest of it, what is the first thing that they're complaining or the second thing they're complaining about his terrible conspiracy theories questioning the safety of genetically modified soybeans. <laughs> I didn't know that, but I mean, how ridiculous is that? They're, they're building up so many layers of deception now and they're getting so silly that I think it's, it's a beautiful time of awakening. You know, he's going through this thing and showing that, uh, you know, that Twitter was, was guilty of, um, of, of silencing him along with the government, the government with, in cahoots with Twitter to silence him. And, I think he's got a fantastic case there that's very interesting. And the other cases that are coming up, like uh, Reiner Fulmik and, 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 and even Stefan Lanker, you know, if he gets there with the fact that a virus isn't even a virus, I, just all of these things where, where, where this whole deep state could end up with his pants right down is incredibly exciting. And that's what we wanted to show, I think, in the book, that it's an exciting time. And, and not to be afraid of it, because I mean, that sounds exactly like my Buddha at the gas pump interview that I was telling you about, where suddenly there's this red warning. This guest has been promoting dangerous conspiracy theories. And this is a friend of mine. And I said to him, what the, what are you doing? What's this? And then he said, well, you know, I've got to warn people. I'm not taking it down because it's you. He took JP Sears' one down. 
but it didn't take mine down. When you have a comedian, when you have a comedian who has been muted, muzzled, why are you muzzling a comedian? His entire job no, well, is making jokes of him. This is a dangerous thing, you know, to look at who it is who's controlling you, look at who you're not allowed to criticize. And that should be so obvious nowadays with this censorship. Anyway, that was just the point I wanted to make. Well, they don't have any common sense anymore. I mean, that's the problem, Phil. You know, like when, when people can't understand that, I mean, to me, when they muzzled a comedian, I was like, oh my God, everybody's going to know that it's true now because he's the comedian. And you don't muzzle a comedian because that's that's how you know that what he's saying is actually true. And anybody who was doubting it should know now because he's a comedian. And they still don't get it. They still aren't waking that's, up. To that's, what, that's what comedians have suppo been supposed to do all down the ages. Look at Bill Hicks. I mean, God, I wish he was alive right now. Right. He'd have, have a few things to say, wouldn't he? What'd you say, Ben? George Carlin. We miss yeah. George. We need George. Right, George, or you have, um, I mean, Chappelle goes back and forth as does this Shiva guy, okay, Phil? So the thing about about him that, I mean, I like liked him and then I was like, dude, he's such a politician and he kept dipping in and out and I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I can't reach you and I can't talk to you. So you must be fake. I don't know. Cause like I can reach this out. Is a, this is a domino thing though, Nisi, isn't it? I mean, people, yeah people have certain things that they believe in and they go one way and he might have some things that are totally wrong but there are some things about him and his story that are going to wake some people up right and like we always say we're saying hey look at this and one of the other ones say no he's controlled opposition you know and we always yeah. do it but we're, we're always open that's the thing always open and now i think right. just anything anything could be true because right. it's it could, it could be true because he could just be like falsely a vegetarian and whatever i mean i'm indian i could have stayed in that I, camp, right? I, I think the key is that the key is that I always refer to it as we need to reject anything which is top down, and we want to encourage everything that's grassroots. And so it could, it could be anything. It could be um, like you talk about doctors, and there, or that you could talk about products and regulation. The regulation should come from word of mouth experience. If someone sells food that's toxic if there's a bakery in town and they sell shitty food you don't need an inspector to come in and close the place down people right. will people will work there word will go around other people will do yeah people will get sick and not go back and tell their friends it should be from the ground unregulated it should be unregulated i'm, I'm for unregulated i mean i'm for deregulation and going back to the wild west and that's what we're advocating and fighting for here all the time because they're trying to tell us you know what we can and cannot eat and but the but the orthodoxy has trained everyone into fearing this freedom because they're because sold on this fake safety which is well, garbage because it, it suits the corporate model the top-down right. approach is look at a complex system divide it into its component moving parts and then control them and play with the levers. And you can get a huge amount of control over that system, but you can never really move it in a beneficial direction because the moment you impose top-down control, you prevent any natural creative growth completely and you freeze it at that. That's the maximum level of creative growth you're ever going to get the moment you exert the top-down control. And so it's a question of, everybody bounces off everybody else and so you might listen to somebody online and go he's got some interesting points so you take those interesting points on board and then someone says to you he's controlled opposition and you go okay he may be but i'm not putting all my yeah you know, i'm not putting all my chips on on him i'm i'm taking what he's throwing out there and then i'm bouncing it off some other completely disconnected people unconnected people and I'm processing it myself using my own discernment and and the feedback of other people in my group. That's how. So you're using logic and critical thinking skills. Is that correct? Yes. Is that what you're but, doing? But I'm not using I'm not using my own logic. I'm trusting in the logic of society. We're we're all we all have our, our different experiences of life's energy. We take all the energy that comes in from the universe and from and other people 
take the same energy that comes in from the universe and we all decode it in a slightly different way. Right. And so rather than obsessing and asking someone up there, how should I decode this? I just take a collection of the vibration that comes back from other people. Right. And then and I that's can... critically receiving it. So you're open to that receiving. And that's you what we want be. people to be, be open to do. Because well, we want people to learn how to do that again. Figure, or you're, you're going to be looking for a savior. So right. to, to avoid looking for a savior, you, you fine tune your own discernment by right. bouncing it off others who are doing the same thing. And we you have all progress at the same time. We have Terry. a savior. You go find a mirror and look in it. And <clears throat> the problem is um, that why we refer to it as the game is people first have to realize they're in a game. And the, the, the intent of this book is to show you um, that you are in a game and you weren't told the rules. In fact, you were educated by the game to not ever get near the rules. So, for example, you, you wanted to bring up earlier on around about medicine and things. Let's just look at that as an example. And, and I want to give my heartfelt um, sympathies that you've had to learn the hard way uh, in your own experiences, Niti, but I have no doubt that it has also changed the course of your life and brought very positive things through your suffering. But <clears throat> you would be a prime example of you did the best with what you knew at the time. Well, let's start there from a get go that most people have no idea that they're not people in the game, they're persons. And persons are this corporate legal entity that is not them. And when you walk into a hospital and enter a ward, they are not aware that you have now left um, certain jurisdictions and you're under their jurisdiction you are, in, you are, in fact, <clears throat> a ward of the state. And this, once you explain this fundamental thing, for people like yourself or any other mother, because it's usually around children where the most problems happen, where they've tried to say, you know what, I don't want this medical treatment, but the doctor whose jurisdiction position is way above you, um, which is why in the films, the police always have to ask permission <clears throat> from the doctor. Can we now speak to the patient? Because they recognize the jurisdictions. You'll see this all the time. Can we, can we speak to them? No, because the doctor is superior in that, in that model. Um, but many mothers would have experienced, I no longer want to continue with this direction of treatment for my child, or I want to leave. And they will suddenly experience how the... Uh, uh, first thought benevolent system suddenly shows its true face, which is no, we're going to treat the child this way. And we're going to remove, and of course, Phil and I, unfortunately, me more so, have had many experiences with mothers, usually the mothers that have fallen absolute victims, uh, shockingly to a system where all of a sudden they realize their child was not their property. And so, you know, this game, we want to present it as a game to remove as much emotion. But if you don't know it's a game, very quickly, you, are, you can be in hell because you don't know you're in a game. You don't know the rules. Many of the people that went into medicine, maybe most of them, really went into hell. But right now, here's another example. We have people, and many nurses contact me, but we have doctors. And we know firsthand and through our own that many of these doctors and nurses are not standing up to what they know is a scandemic because of fear, fear of being persecuted, fear of losing their jobs, their income, back to that fake money. And so <clears throat> only when they're in the game, when, only when you learn the game, can we collectively come together and say, you know what? Let's turn our back on this game and let's play a very different game. And that game's always been running in the background and they've made you look over there. It's that potentially simple. That's what I love. That's what I love about the book. Because you're like, come this way. We don't need to do that. 
come this way. And that's what I love about avarism is because it gives people a, uh, a, a, a standard, um, a code, a something for them to understand is a system that they can follow and know like you see in the book and this this meme is the truth shall set you free if the source of fear is real deal with it if it is false banish it so you know as a mother who was in the hospital and you know i was challenging all the physicians jeremy and they found me to be the most threatening mother ever and they actually had meetings with me to tell me that I was interfering with her care because I was advocating for her. And I was reminding them powerfully, constantly, by recording every conversation I had, did not talk to them ever without a recording. And also we had our entire family, we were like a gang of people in there. So, you know, they, it was a little bit more difficult, but what people don't, I warn parents all the time, I'm like, they can lock you out of the hospital and they do. They, they banished parents out of the hospital and take custody of the children. And they were trying to take custody of all of my children and I was pregnant and they were trying to do, take custody of the child to be born. I mean, it was crazy. Um, but it's yeah, and I, it was not crazy. You see, the, 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 the thing, you know, what, what you brought up a very important uh, thing here that I, I think what is so scary about about this which i think is being revealed as the, as the confidence goes down in the medical system and hopefully it will and hopefully not too many people will have real problems with these vaccines and maybe they'll come through it a bit and you know we are losing people to them but it is making people question a lot of things and hopefully hopefully that will be a knock on because you know you were wise enough to question these people and i've been up against them as well you know i got one rheumatologist so angry he was foaming at the mouth and shouting at me you know and, and they get such arrogance from their enormously deep brainwashing. But then again, there's this kind of Stockholm syndrome. And a lot of people who are in your position then go on to, to, to um, instead of really question them and find out what's going on, they'll, they'll go on to, to start sort of charities in their kids' names saying how wonderful the doctors were and, and sort of then worship them. And, and then- They're they terrified, get, Phil. They're threatened. Yeah, I know. And, know and, I was, I was so thing. pregnant. I, I was I, I was so pregnant. They were saying to me, you know, they said to me when I said I was going to leave when we were leaving the hospital, they told me they said your daughter is never going to meet her brother or sister and good luck. And I was like, who says that to a pregnant mother? Who, who says that? These are supposed to be noble people. My mom said to me, she goes, I can't believe that you're arguing with the physicians. I said, are you kidding me? I said, this is a professional who you think is God or whatever, who's threatening me while I'm pregnant and threatening that, you know, threatening our children on top of the fact that they broke their Hippocratic. First of all, let me just start by saying my daughter, when she presented with her cancer, that she was already terminal at best. They already knew she was, you know, palliative at best. Okay. And they should have, if they were following their oath, they should have said, go enjoy your daughter. There's nothing that we know that we can do. We are here for you to support you with pain management or whatever you might need and emergent care, but, you know, connected us with hospice. That's what they should have done if they were being responsible and if they were following the oath, which they were not. And so when people tell me that I'm whatever kind of conspiracy theorist, I'm like, okay, I want you to tell me who I'm conspiring with and where the money is, because I want my payout from wherever it's supposed to be coming from. I have nothing to gain from this and I have already lost everything. And I'm only advocating for your children because my daughter's already dead. So, you know, these are very serious pieces that we're trying to wake people up to. And I know that was, okay, I'm going against the kind, loving thing. No, it so is, I'll, no, I'll, Lisa, I'll, Lisa, it, is, it is kind and loving because Sometimes you've got to you've got to be a bit a little bit harsh to to wake people up because what would they rather do? Would they rather go through something like you've gone through, or you'll have a go at them and wake them up? You know how 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 about me? You know I'll I'll have a go at somebody when they're they're getting sucked into rheumatology or whatever, and they'll get cross with me for a bit, but and I have to I have sort of give them a bit of a slap and say what well, everything you believe is crap, and and they're sort of offended. How dare you say that? Well, you know it's because. I can show you some way to, to, to get better without these people, without this, this incredible deep Dunning-Kruger effect that's going on there. 
Because we I, love I you so I much. I saw, I heard a great one the other day. You know, when you're just shouted at for being a conspiracy theorist and an anti-vaxxer, I heard a great expression for an anti-vaxxer the other day. It's just somebody who reads the vaccine insert. I uh, thought so it's just people can't be bothered to look beyond. The doctor says it's okay. I don't need to. And half the doctors haven't read the inserts either. That's all. It's still loving. You know, you can love your child and have a bit of a shout at them. And we've all been shouted at. I get shouted at, you know, and, and sometimes those are the best times to be woken up. John. I've got a, su I've got a suggestion on, on, on maybe maybe a, um, a another loving approach that, that, that one might take to, to situations like this. Um, as ludicrous as it would be to walk into a fast food restaurant and start demanding high-end sushi um, or a high-end steak, um, you could certainly make the argument that they're both in the food industry. Um, it's just as ludicrous to walk into a allopathic hospital and demand health and wellness. Um, it, it, it's just as ludicrous to, uh, to expect um, like turning to someplace like the, the WHO or, or, or the CDC for health and wellness would be like turning to the McDonald's Corporation for nutritional advice. I mean, McDonald's Corporation is certainly in the food industry. One could certainly make that argument. But is that really where you're going to source your nutritional advice from? And, and if, if people um, who, are, who are wherever you might be along your journey of um, trying to put this all into perspective, if you could just grasp the, 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 the commercial, non-commercial aspect of things, and then just know your sources. Um, there, there, there are people who are arguing to the death um, right now over Johnson & Johnson, okay? Now, now let's just talk about Johnson & Johnson as a source. That is a company that, is, if, 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 I, if I have my notes correct, for the last 40 years has been openly, and this is gonna sound wacky, but openly killing babies via ovarian cancer through their talc powder. This is not blogosphere woo stuff. This is, these are high end, you know, high, high end lawsuits, billions of dollars paid out. And, and this is the same company that we're supposed to trust for a, a, a jab or, or whatever. I wouldn't trust Johnson and John. I actually, I would trust my ex-wife before I would trust Johnson and Johnson, just Johnson based on their, their the, the track record that you could find doing ten minutes of 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 research on a crappy search engine like Google. Can I, you know, John, crappy. John, isn't it fantastic, John? You just said there that everything like that. Once you see one thing, this is what we're trying to do in the book. You see, we're going into specifics here, but we don't really in the book. It's it's showing people the pattern of everything that when you when you go local with your food, when you go local even with your music you know, you get some genuine stuff. John, you all know that, that how the, the, the music industry has been destroyed by all this sort of stuff coming from the top down. I mean, when I look at something like X Factor now and you're just like, oh, come on. And these poor people, they get given hope. And even the ones that win don't get a proper career. But back in the day when there were fewer, like a famous drummer friend of mine, Bill Bruford once said to me, you were born 10 years too late. The music that you're doing, you should have been doing 10 years before and you'd have made a fortune by now, you know, because he did. He played drums in Yes and Genesis and the prog groups and stuff like that. And, and he's still living on money that he made when he was 17 to 23 years old, because then since then, proper music has collapsed. He carried on playing just as wonderful music, but it wasn't allowed by the system. It wasn't allowed to come through. And I think I hope that this whole lunacy now will will take us back to a more local uh, mindset with our food, with our music, with everything, where it isn't controlled by this central sort of globalist nonsense. So well, that's I, on that point. I'm 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 only going to interrupt a little bit. I know that you want to say something, Jeremy, but it's to it, uh, I'm trying to keep the time, okay? But on that point, Phil, you know, when you go local, guys, it's not just about the quality, which is absolutely better. OK, but also and also the fact that you're dealing with another human being and not a corporation, which is not a human being um, that is not alive. And that person is going to feel more responsible about, you know, being honest with you. And, and they don't want you to die like they're not trying to allow you to become sick or anything. But you are also doing what's called counter economics in our agorist community. And so the counter economic piece should just be enough motivation, because if we're disempowered, 
if we're defunding these people, people are like, how do you do it? I want to talk about the solutions here, guys, in these last few minutes, because I want to, I mean, I want to make sure that we offer solutions to everyone because there's so many in this book. Okay. First of all, get the book because it will empower you. It has massive amount of solutions, but, um, and, and, and learn about, you know, what's going on with agorism, learn about what's happening. You have freedom cells everywhere, but uh, you guys say in the book, it is an, it is the absolute right of the state to supervise the formation of public opinion. It's um, one of the quotes here. And then also you're saying, you know, is there any chance, choice to opt out? And is there any accountability? Is there freedom to dissent? So who wants to speak? Yeah, on I this? just want on the back of everything and tying that all in, um, you know, we, particularly perhaps myself and then Phil, have dealt one-to-one -one with families and individuals who have fallen foul of medicine and um, <clears throat> finances and all the things that make people sick, okay? And there's always very, very great uh, emotions, negative anger and what have you. You've experienced extraordinarily powerful negative angry emotions and justifiably now when we came together that's why ben has done such a masterful job because we could have ranted particularly myself maybe maybe graham and phil was always kind of cool until last year where he's had some cases like mine and then he was frothing at the mouth of it but we could have ranted with just cause you know i i have weeks and weeks of stories I could share with you that would make your blood boil. But Ben beautifully captured that the solution was the, the foundational knowledge so that it can diffuse that and hopefully avoid you walking into those because you didn't know what you'd walked into. So now we have to deal with the effects of that to get you back into a place where once again, you can consider that those bastards aren't bastards. Those bastards are utterly believing the game and the game they're in. They absolutely believe they did the right thing. Yes, we all know some narcissistic surgeons, doctors, consultants, police officers, what have you. But the vast majority of people are good and want a, want a, a good life and they believe what they're doing. This book is so powerful. It changed us and we wrote it. This book has the ability to give you a moment to reconsider and then join us because it's not just a book, put it down. You know, we want, we have a, a forum that we're starting. We want this to continue to explore how as a collective with this understanding of the game that we were educated and born into, how it can be redirected to truly be benevolent, to, to truly benefit everyone. See, we love common law and common sense one of the most uncommon things found nowadays, but we love it because as Graham said, with like the bakers or the you know, whatever, you, it, the freedom to do as you wish, as long as it causes no harm. You should have been able to freely choose what was right for your child, even if it was wrong, okay? Even if it was wrong, okay? But that was taken away from you and all that that creates. So I think this book, has achieved, and, 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 our, and the credit goes to Ben. Well, of course, we all wrote it in the contributions, but we got ranty. You know, we've been down rabbit holes that most people don't want to go down and came out the other side. And the other side is full of light. And that's what this book is about. We, th what's going on is the microcosm, macrocosm of dis-ease. And we need a big shakeup to see the mistakes we've been either steered into or quite happily ignored. And this is what this time is. And so this is what this book is. It's a, it's a light to guide you down a certain way. You, what well, you choose, but it's a light. Well, Ray, one just, oh, can I do a really, really quick one just before you set this? Yeah, everybody, everybody take a turn and say what you want people to get out of this book. I think that would be really good. And go sure, ahead. Well, you know, the, the guys have covered that. There was just one little thing that, that I always come back to because I, I have, you know, I'm always getting red carded by Jeremy on Facebook for saying ridiculous things. And I, I have this, this sort of uh, probably 
a little bit too far sense of the ridiculous. But what I love about this whole situation and everything, however serious everything is, is the creativity. You were saying you mustn't you mustn't uh, censor uh, comedians. But just to make them, instead of attacking these people, make them look utterly ridiculous. You know, I think I think that when you know in our in our uh, country, when um, Boris and and the reptilian bloke and the other one come out to give all the sort of spiel of what's the latest thing going on, if there was just a crowd of people who just stood there just pointing and laughing and just crying with laughter at the nonsense of it, and you can still maintain the seriousness of it, but some of the beautiful memes that have gone around during this time are just so creative and just marvelous. And if we can keep it to that level, uh, largely, that would be wonderful to just see the absolute absurdity of these people. And then that takes the stress off you instead of wanting to go and kill them. And, you know, like, you know, we've all had maybe a little, a little fantasy of being in a room with Bill Gates and a pair of pliers, but, you know, it, just, just to take it out of that for a lot of the time and just see the utter, utter absurdity of, of, of what's going on. Anyway, sorry, Graham. No, it's, it's interesting you, you brought it back around to where I was going to go. Um, I'm, I'm very aware that we're using YouTube as the broadcasting platform, so I'll be a little careful. But we wrote this book. We started writing it in 2019, um, and so pre-COVID. Um, and then we wrote it, and, and the COVID developed, and we also... At the time, we were we were asked by our, our um, Human Unleashed members, which we produced we produced content for them, which is behind a paywall, and they asked if we would do a special episode on COVID. So this was in March last year, so we did, um, and they they loved it so much they wanted to share it with the sort of friends and family, and so we found a way to to put it onto YouTube so it was freely available, and we've done about twenty five episodes. And amazingly, we didn't get banned. We're only the last couple, the last one got banned from uh, YouTube because it was too close to, to, the, to the bone. But what's, what's emerged from the book, we finished it, we included a small section on COVID because we had to, because it's the greatest psyop in, probably in history, to be honest. Um, so we had to include it. And what has occurred since we wrote the book, since we finished it, has been this massive division in society, division within families, division within friendship groups. And there's, a, there's situations where people are either, they're not talking, they've, defriend, they've unfriended people, or there are people who are unable to talk to their sister or their brother um, because of their views of, of the, the, the current COVID situation whether it's related to the injectable experiment or whether it's related to the disease itself or, or the concepts or whatever. Um, and what we found is that many, many people have bought this book, The Red Pill Revolution. They've read it and they've said, I want to buy five copies because I, I need my brother or my sister-in-law to read this because I think it will help rebuild the bridge because they're so far gone and they think I'm so far gone in the other direction that there's an abyss between us that's opened up, which is very, very sad. Um, and this, uh, this, again, this abyss has been artificially created by the game because it divides and weakens. I mean, um, it's a divide and, and conquer art of yeah, war style it's attack. It's constantly used. And so what has been very, very pleasant for us to, to discover is that people are, are seeing the use of this book as... I'm going to gift it to someone, give them a couple of weeks to read it, and then hopefully we can have a calmer conversation about why I believe what I believe about the COVID psyop and why you were misled into believing what you believe. And then we can have a calm conversation and both decide how to go forward together. So what it's been very, very nice to, to hear and to find out that it, the book has its use also as a, a a bridge to rebuild bridges in families and communities, which is tremendous. Yeah, the key the thing I'd like to end on is is how we we do stress in the book, and we've been touching on this throughout this discussion, which has been wonderful. But really, the key the key aspect of the, the red pill revolution, and what is the red pill revolution? And we don't, it's not a top-down thing. We don't all take to the streets with torches and pitchforks and overthrow the government and install somebody else as, 
as our glorious leader. The Red Pill Revolution starts in your mind, starts in your thinking, starts in the, the simple, honest, natural, wide-eyed, childlike way that we perceive the world. And it, it's actually more about not doing. It's more about letting go of stuff and just keeping it real. So this is not, this is not violent. We're not going to be, you know, gun-wielding rebels. We're going to be quiet rebels. And we're just going to wake up and we're going to smile and we go, actually, I kind of like this universe. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy myself. I, I don't know what's right. I don't know what's wrong. And there's so much now that I can just safely, like Phil says, just smile at, grin, laugh at, and then ignore and go on about my day. I want to feed my family. I want to look after, you know, the people that I love. What more is there to life? John? Absolutely. The right. way my screen was arranged, Jeremy was next. So I didn't want to be jumping in front of him. But no, I, no I'll definitely take it. I would, love, um, I would love nothing more for people to walk away from... Uh, from reading this book and, and, and hopefully watching, there's a quite a big video discussion at the end of every chapter that uh, you, you can, you can go in uh, if, if, if you are so inclined, but I'd like um, just for more people to, to recognize um, what statism or corporatism actually is recognize it for the religion that it is. And it is a religion. It requires belief in a higher authority. And, um, and in some instances, it requires belief in invisible things that science can't prove, um, which should irritate some of you. Um, uh, if there's any, uh, you know, antagonistic atheists out there, <laughs> that 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 maybe that maybe that just gets you right there. So good. Um, but I, I would love I would love for people to just know the the difference between statism and non-statism, and, and 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 recognize that because I think when you when you do and you, and you start looking at life, be it food, be it medicine, be it religion, be it sports, be it music, whatever, when you start looking at it in a, 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 in a corporate versus non-corporate way, um, makes, it easier to, uh, makes it easier to navigate. You don't have to navigate with emotion um, because you recognize that the corporate state is that abusive boyfriend or girlfriend that is just going to keep doing it until you break up with them. And, um, and, and hopefully uh, this book helps, uh, helps you break up. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that, you know, um, I've always said that, that, that dis-ease is a blessing in disguise. And whatever uh, hardships you've been through or, or, or are going through, um, and Niti, I, I, I'm, confident that, that you'll resonate with this can be a blessing in disguise of course there's some things we wish we could go back and not have gone through and change the outcomes but ultimately um i believe it's all lessons and, and when we learn to see them through different eyes or from a different angle it can be you know very very transformative and i'll, I'll leave an example that my, my wife when i met her 10 years ago was terminally ill uh, which she's thriving now and of which she did most of the work herself and I came along and helped complete it. But her statement was cancer saved my life. And I'm very, very sorry for your daughter, but in her case, she saw a lot of that, what she needed to change. And her, her sentence is cancer saved my life because she became a more authentic version of herself. All these things going on right now, I believe are opportunities for you to question and look and it's those three stages of truth, eh? That what we began discussing with the COVID a year ago, 25, 26 episodes at thehumanunleashed.com, which is also where the uh, one hour in, um, discussions we have on each um, chapter of the book is, which, which is also wonderful, is uh, that the, the first time a lot of people come uh, exposed to some of this information, it's disbelief. And then the second time they come at it, it's aggressive pushback. And then something happens and they see. And it's that dominoes, you know, things start to open up. And when you see with new eyes and when you see for, to your own satisfaction 
how things really are and that the power i mean it's always said right love is love is the key and and it is really but we sometimes have to be quite harsh and quite hard and professionally i have, I have to say things that upset people to show them things it's love and so this book has been written and toned by by Ben. It's all love. And you can go down many rabbit holes where it gets dark and come back out. But it's love that's going to change it. It's truth that's going to change this and a willingness to accept that the game has not had your best interests at heart. Well, first of all, I want you to know, Jeremy, that um, I believe that my daughter came into this world to save our lives and she saved a lot of lives as a side effect of our experience with her. And she has touched so many lives. She definitely didn't only save our lives. She has allowed us also to walk in truth. And I have what I'm calling my army of Minas. I've always been inviting people to be, become part of that. And by coming to the church today, this is my food church. You all are part of our army of Minas. So I appreciate you so much for that. And you say that this is building bridges and that is what I do with my nonprofit. The purpose of the food church is to build bridges and connect people. And I really, really hope that, um, I know that according to the chat right now on YouTube, people are buying the book. So I, I hope that they'll all get it. They should, you know, um, I don't know if I could give this to my mom or to our, my in-laws and they would actually read it after they read the outside of it, because their mind is just where they're at right now, you know, but I love that it allows me to walk in a little bit more confidence, have a little bit more compassion and love for them. It allows me to see them as a toddler trying to walk versus, you know, screaming at them because it's not my work to save anyone else. I've, it took a long time for me to learn that. And I think as, as a physician yourself, you probably um, realize that you can't save anybody. Nobody can save someone else. You can only lead the horse to water as they say. Right. But, um, I think that this definitely is a bridge builder. And if, even if you can't give the book to someone to read, you can practice what's in the book and it allows me, I think to just walk more powerfully in my knowing. So I do appreciate that. Yeah, yes. I, mean, I think it's it's a book. It's a book not for the, to foist on somebody who is completely terrified of everything. It's a, but it's for those teetering people. You know, it's perfect for them. Oh, they're just starting to doubt. Oh, well, have a look at this. It's not to you know. No, you're right. It is absolutely. If you're the person who's been walking the line and you're still on the line and you haven't fallen off because you have to draw a line in the sand at this moment, you can't kind of walk the line anymore. You have to choose aside I think then anyway right gentlemen <laughs> Ben you want to wrap it up oh, I don't know I don't know I just um and it, it's been a hell of a journey it's been a wonderful wonderful experience writing the book meeting these guys getting this stuff together you know we are thankful that we've been privileged and and being able to to do this and honestly this book couldn't have come out of any of us it needed the five of us to come together and we are beyond humbled by the responses that that we've that we've gotten so far from people all around the world it, we've sent it to every corner of the world right now already and um so thank you for having us on thank you for the opportunity of of letting us um talk about it and and share this i it's uh it's something we're all very, very proud of. And we, and we, you know, we've put a lot of work into, a lot of love into. So thank you again. Thanks everybody for tuning in. And I look forward to seeing you guys all next week where I'm going to have uh, Dr. Sean Baker here with us. Um, so you can come and learn about what's going on on MeetRx from him.